Um, I'm going to deviate from the traditional academic talk, as you could gather by what I look like at this point and where I am looking. Um, on this screen is the PowerPoint slide. I'll orient you to the rest in just a few minutes. So if you want to see where the PowerPoints are, look at your left front. I want to create an immersive experience, much like at a planetarium. So you'll have lots of things to look at throughout the talk. Let me orient you first, because we know through a lot of research done here at Michigan, it's difficult to multitask, right? So it's difficult to look at multiple screens. So let's take one screen at a time. What's happening to me right now? I'm in front of an audience speaking. And it turns out that one of the most surefire ways to produce the stress response is to force people to speak in front of an audience. And that's typically used by several uh, uh, fields to be able to examine stress in the laboratory, is to tell people that they're going to have to speak in front of an audience. And that's what I'm doing right now. So how, how could you measure my stress level? Well, as a behavioral scientist, I was taught to use self-report. And we'll talk about self-report in a little bit. There certainly is a place for self-report. But there are many other ways that I could measure stress. Right? My facial expressions could be used, for example. Now, the face, um, we could take the way, you know, my current face, and in real time put a wire mesh over my face. And that wire mesh has control points. And as those control points move, they could be coded for displays of different emotions, right? Which muscles are contracting in the face would indicate which emotions are being uh, expressed through the face. And over in this part, uh, for those of you that know a little bit about theory of emotions, one of the prominent theories is a two-dimensional space of emotion, valence, positive or negative, as one dimension, and activity or uh, you know, strong active emotions or passive weak, weak emotions. And so right now, I'm making a neutral face uh, that is relatively uh, in, inactive. So let's look at, for example, what uh, the face coding might look like uh, on someone who has a videotape. Here's one of our research assistants. And the video you can see on her face, there's a square. So this is her her actual face, this is what the computer is processing, and in, uh, soon you'll see a mesh on her face. And then uh, as the mesh moves around, as she makes different expressions, a machine learning algorithm is coding the movement around that two-dimensional space. So it's still calibrating, and uh, pretty soon she'll start making a few uh, expressions. Yeah, so she smiles, happy. Now we have some surprised. And this machine learning algorithm is coding this in real time. If you wanted to, you could take the codings, uh, which are equivalent in accuracy to human coders using the Ekman system. Uh, or you could save, save the raw data, the movement of the control points, and do your own analyses. Okay? So uh, I'm not showing that uh, currently. Uh, in real time because we don't have enough screens and, uh, and computing power to, to do all of that simultaneously. All right, so we could ask self-report for stress. We could uh, look at my facial expressions. We could look at brain activity, or more precisely, electrical currents produced by my neurons firing. So on your left, on the side, are nine channels of EEG and my, an ECG channel. So the very top one is my heart, and the next nine are nine electrodes that are placed on my scalp. Now to orient you in terms of this, I'm going to blink my eyes, and you'll see on the left, I'm sorry, on the right part of the screen, I'll blink my eye once, so you'll see a little spike, then I'll do twice, you'll see two spikes, then three times, you'll see three spikes, then four you'll see four. All right, so here I go. (laughs) 
All right. So this is recorded. Of course, that was my muscle movement, uh, which is producing an artifact uh, in terms of brain activity. So that's going on on your left. I have wireless uh, recording of my heart rate and skin response. So one thing that happens when you're under stress is you begin to sweat, right? So that creates a differential and electric conductance in your, on your skin. And so that's being recorded on, the, on your right. And the upper one is my heart rate. The bottom one is the skin conductance. Okay. Now up here in the front, I have laser eyes. I have wearing an eye tracker, and wherever it is that I'm looking is showing up. There's a camera pointing out from the glasses, so it's seeing where the, my eyes are pointed to. There are also two cameras behind the glasses pointed to my eyes, and so it's recording where, where my eyes are looking. Okay? So if I look, for instance, at the trash can right by the door, um, and if I scan the audience, right? It gets dizzy, I know. But. Um, if I do the, the MRI. Now, imagine what it would be like if all of you were also connected to all these systems. And we could examine not just what the speaker is saying and their biological reactions, but also the audience members. Or if this was a classroom, the teacher could be wired up and all the students could be wired up. And we could be looking, for instance, at what point does a particular type of student you know, tune out and start checking email or texting their friends. Uh, there are other modes that we could be collecting that are just not practical for me to do right now in real time. Um, I could go into an MRI machine and we would have much better spatial resolution of uh, some brain activity or correlates of brain activity than the nine channels of EEG that, that are over there. And we could also be collecting, oh, uh, one thing I want to point out that I'll come back to. With an MRI, there's uh, a tremendous increase in the num amount of data that we're, we're collecting. The EEG right there has nine channels, so I have nine electrodes on my scalp. And so you think that might be a lot, nine channels to look at. The MRI has about 100,000 waves. So as you move around a particular point in 3D space of the brain, there's at that location, at that voxel, there's a, a wave activity form during the data collection period. So you go from nine channels to 10,000 channels in an MRI. Now it's very easy to get genetic testing. Companies like uh, 23andMe, for about 100 bucks, you, you, uh, they send you a kit, you provide a saliva sample, and they'll do a genetic uh, sequence on you. So here, one of our colleagues, who I blocked out his name, but right before the talk, he said it was okay for me to mention his name, is Coulter Mitchell. So Col Coulter uh, gave us the results of his uh, 23andMe test. So we know his uh, ancestry is 99.9% European. He uh, only has 2.6 Neanderthal in him, <laughs> um, as according to the, to the output. And we know the, the risk of different diseases like melanoma and Alzheimer's disease and so on. And we also know something about the distribution throughout uh, the continents of where that particular gene is distributed that he, that he tends to have, which is mainly in the uh, Northern Europe region. Okay, we could also collect hormones. Um, I could provide saliva samples and they can be processed. Uh, in this case, I'm showing some hormone data of a public speaking task, the TRIER task, which is you actually have participants uh, prepare a public uh, speech and they have to get up in front of people and, sp and speak. And these are uh, cortisol levels over time. And what this graph shows is that there's a complicated interaction between genetics and epigenetics. So this is for uh, uh, the three different curves are the uh, particular serotonin SNP. There's a short 
and long repeats. And so you're either a short, short, a long, long, or a short, long. And the methylation reflects uh, uh, epigenetic measure. I don't want to get into the details of that, but when there's low methylation compared to high methylation, that moderates the stress re reactivity that cortisol displays in that for the low methylation, you see a genetic effect in terms of the number of short alleles, but that genetic effect disappears in a different condition of methylation. So it shows that there are very complicated interactions between the different biological processes, right? The genetics, the genetic expression, and the, um, the epigenetic processes. All this points to we need to be examining multiple systems if you want to get a handle on a concept like stress. Any one of the systems alone is probably insufficient, right? So self-report has value. Um, where I'm looking, am I nervously looking away at the audience? Am I scanning to look for fr friendly faces, um, right? That gives you information. My facial expressions give you information. My skin response, my EEG, my heart rate, all that gives you information. And the difficult part we have as scientists is we don't really know how to integrate all that information together. We know how to play Noah's Ark and take two variables at a time and publish papers that take two variables at a time, but we're not very good yet at being able to integrate across multiple systems that involve multiple time scales, that have multiple factors and determinants, and, but yet they all are part of a system such as the stress response. Okay. So this leads us now into the sort of biosocial methods collaborative. Why is it that we need to have a new, you know, sit back and take stock of the methods that we have available, both in data collection, data modeling, and data analysis? So there's a lot of buzz right now around big data, right? NIH and NSF have launched huge efforts now in terms of bringing in more scientific study involving big data at all levels. Um, it's even hit the psychological conferences. Last year at one of our major conferences, uh, there was uh, several different uh, sessions on how to use big data to understand behavior. Now one of my colleagues, Dan Ariely, tweeted this about big data a couple of years ago. He said, big data is like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, so everyone claims they're doing it. <laughs> now, big data means different things to people. For some people, it just means you have lots of subjects, right? 10 million subjects, because you have the medical records from an entire insurance company. So you have 10 million records. Uh, and there's a popular book that came out last year This, you know, basically talked about N equal all. That's what big data allows you to do. For some people, big data just means that you have a lot of predictors. You know, you might have millions of predictors and you're trying, you know, where P, the number of predictors, is greater than the sample size. Uh, you, big data might involve he heavy computing time, lots of processing, because maybe you're doing lots of simulations or the numerical algorithms are very difficult, and so you need a lot of processing time. It also means that there's lots of different types of data. There are texts, there are images, there are waveform data, right? Lots of data from different sources that are difficult to put together. It could also mean lots of data is coming through in real time, right? Heavy streaming of data. Now, most of the advances in big data that have come from industry have tried to meet a different goal, and that goal is prediction, right? What, what Amazon cares about is selling books or selling their goods. So they want to be able to find patterns that when you behave in a particular way, they know what ads to place on their website, right? So in real time, it's calculating what's the best bet to put on the website so that you stay there, you buy more, you interact with the website. They don't care about understanding why. All they care about is prediction. Now science has a slightly different goal. We use prediction as a criterion to evaluate our understanding, our theories, and our models, right? But we put stock, in addition to prediction, we also place stock on understanding. 
And most of the current big data techniques uh, fall short of that understanding side, but I don't think it's so much the techniques themselves. It's more how they're used and the way that studies are designed and, uh, and some other details that I'll get into later in the talk is what provides the, the understanding that we seek. Right? So here's a New, New Yorker cartoon, get me everything on everybody. So for me, big data is one of the pieces of big data, I'm sorry, of, the, of integrating biological and social science data. Now, social scientists have a role to play in this debate or this sort of new development around big data. Certainly the computer scientists and the machine learners and the statisticians and so on are, are there and they need to be there. But when it comes to trying to understand patterns and behavior and social processes, you need to have social scientists there to help you understand what the data mean. Right? And so far, I don't think that social science has done a very good job of, of being a, a player in the space of big data. Uh, so it requires us to develop a whole new set of collaborators that we're not used to collaborating with and developing mo new kinds of models, working with new kinds of data, and really thinking in different ways than how many of us were trained in graduate school and how some of you are currently being trained in graduate school. Richard, yeah. Oh, they're disconnected. All right, I think I'll take them off. And <laughs> that point was already made. Um, good. The EEG is still on, so that's good. <clears throat> so a year ago, we started uh, this new group. Uh, it's a center for all intents and purposes called the Biosocial Methods Collaborative. And we currently have over 100 members who have participated uh, to agree to have their name listed and to be part of our mailing list and to participate in events that we have. And many of you are, are, are here, are members. Um, Really, the purpose of the Biosocial Methods Collaborative is to try to bring social scientists, behavioral scientists together with researchers from all over campus to try to find better ways of working with biological and behavioral science data and being more intelligent about how we collect the data, how we think about it, how we process it, how we analyze it, and how we model it. Biosocial or biopsychosocial has been around for at least 40 years. There's this paper from 1977 by Engel talking about the biomedical model in psychiatry. And there's a call there at that time for bringing in bio, or sorry, psycho and social into the medical model. And if you go back in time, you see lots of these calls. But I don't think we've done a very good job of um, merging the biological the psychological and the social. Now you might think, why do we even need the behavioral and the social science? If you're not a social scientist, maybe that's what you're thinking. Because you're saying, well, the gold standard is the, uh, the outcome on the medical result, right? Did the tumor shrink? Did the heart disease go away? Did, you know, what, what, whatever the metric is, you think it's a biological metric. But for many things, behavior and social factors are a very important part of that process. If we look at obe uh, obesity and diabetes and hypertension, for example, those are uh, syndromes that involve multiple, multiple factors at multiple levels. And for me, one of the best examples to illustrate the importance of psychological and behavioral science variables is the idea of temperature. We could all agree that uh, column of mercury, the height in a tube, leads to a particular temperature, 70 degrees. That's the objective measurement. But one person feels cold and then the other person feels hot. Right? That's, there's, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the subjective experience that you feel hot or cold, even though it's 70 degrees. It's, there is value in understanding the subjective response in addition to having a, a sense of the objective um, the objective measurement, okay? Now, as I started working with integrating biological and social science data, 
and started trying to think about ways of merging these different sources of variables. Um, I noticed that we typically don't go as far as just adding a variable to our regression equation. Right? If you're a bio biologist, you'll add something like gender or s a SCS variable. If you're a social science person, you'll add a, a dependent variable that you collected. You put someone in a magnet and you measure bold or, or you put one of these things on and measure EEG uh, or skin response or you get biomarker data of some type and then you add that to your regression equation. And that's fine, it's gotten us some of the way there, but we need to go much, much further than just adding variables to the regression equation. So what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is give some examples of the kind of research that a few of the members of the Biosocial Method Collaborative are doing, and some of uh, the methods that are being developed. So one of the factors that we need to work on is study design before we ever collect the data. How do we design a study so that we optimize the most information, right, the best signal to noise ratio across all the modes that we're taking? Um, give you one example from Fred Morrison, who's here. Um, there is a task that's used in developmental psychology. It's the head, shoulders, knees, and toes task, this one right here. And it's used to measure self-regulation and control in children. So Fred and his colleagues wanted to bring that task into a more neuro context and measure EEG. Now, it's very difficult to do the head, shoulders, knees, and toes when you're moving around, right? There's a lot of noise. So they had to redesign the task, still be able to have the elements, the behavioral elements of self-regulation and control, but in a, more, uh, in a different setting that allowed for very few muscle movements, that allowed for relatively high signal-to-noise ratios in this particular response that they were after, the ERN. And so the task that they developed uh, was one of the child is helping the zookeeper find animals that have escaped from the zoo. And the orangutans are helping the zookeeper find the other animals. And so the child is supposed to look at the computer screen and as the scenes change, is supposed to click when they see not an orangutan but some other animal because they've detected, they're helping the zookeeper and the orangutan find animals. But if they see an orangutan, they're not supposed to click because the orangutans are the helpers, right? This is basically the, the version that they came up with. So this was a way to measure uh, self-regulation and control in such a way that they were able to get uh, a, a clear signal with respect to a particular part of their brain on a particular response that happens at a particular time point after the response is executed, after the child presses uh, a button, and it's on error trials. Okay, so this involved not just taking an off-the-shelf measurement like EEG with another off-the-shelf measurement like the head, shoulders, knees, and toes. It involved a very careful collaboration, rethinking of bringing two different tasks together and reconceptualizing what you can do with the constraints of both tasks. Um, this is something that we don't do well. Uh, we, I mean, not just here at Michigan, but I think anywhere in the world. We're very siloed in how we approach our science. So if you have a hormone processing facility, you become the expert on hormones and you know everything there is to do, what the optimal time course is to collect your data, what you have to be doing when the subject is spitting into the tubes, et cetera. If you're in the MRI center, you have very specialized knowledge about what's the optimal way to collect data in the scanner and so on. But if you want to do a study that integrates across those silos, it falls apart because we don't have a very good mechanism for the hormone people to interact with the imaging people, to interact with the genetics people, to interact with the behavioral people and say, sit down at the table and acknowledge that we have to make trade-offs. In order to get a good signal in the imaging, we have to give up something in the behavioral task. 
in order to do something good in terms of the signal for hormones, we might have to alter the MRI task, the data collection of the MRI. We don't have a group that's thinking across the silos, that's providing help on how do you design a study, what's the optimal way to collect data when you have more than one biological measurement and more than one behavioral measurement. So to me, that's an opportunity. The fact that there really aren't many, many groups in the world thinking about this is a place for us to really make the mark. Right? So I'm going to give an example. This is a hypothetical example. Suppose that I want to study stress, and I go to the hormone expert, and they start telling me, well, the gold standard is blood or saliva, and you have to collect the data this way and that way. So I follow their, all their advice that they give me, I do my study, but then I have a very hard time getting it published. And the reason is because my research question might have been something such as the cumulative effect of stress over several months. But the saliva is capturing the momentary cortisol. So there's a mismatch between the measurement and the research question. So if I was just able to talk to the hormone expert in such a way as saying, this is my research question, maybe the hormone expert would have said, well, even though saliva might be the gold standard, given your research question, it might be sensible for you to switch and collect hair samples because from the hair, you can collect deposits of cortisol. About three centimeters of hair uh, like rings on a tree, tells you cortisol levels for three months. And so if your research question is about cumulative effects of stress, where you need to know something about the cortisol levels over several weeks, the hair is a better measure, even though from a signal-to-noise ratio, it's no match to the saliva. But as a researcher, you need to be informed so you can make all the trade-offs that you can make to optimize the data for your research question. Okay? So just some simple examples of what I mean by being able to integrate. Another trade-off, some ERP experts will tell me, what, you have a, scap with a scalp uh, cap with only nine electrodes? Why do you only have nine electrodes? You need you know, 32 or 64 or 128. Well, it's about making trade-offs. It takes about an hour to an hour and a half to put a, a, scap, a, a cap with 64 electrodes. And if I want to have multiple modes, I want to have eye tracker and EEG and heart rate and skin response, I might have to have the participant there for two, two and a half hours before the study ever starts just to get them calibrated. And maybe that is not what I want to do. Maybe I can only, I can only afford to have the participant there for 45 minutes. So I make trade-offs. I say, okay, I give up a little bit on fidelity in terms of spatial location. I don't use 64 or 128 electrodes. I give up some of that fidelity in order to get some signal on the, ER, the ERP because now I'm able to connect with other modes, the eye tracking, whatever, you know, the hormones, whatever else you want to collect. There's a symptom that I'm calling my variable myopia. And that's the, uh, the focusing on whatever it was that you're trained in and your, your research, right? So this is a, a word cloud from the collaborative website. And what my variable myopia does is if you're an imager, you focus on bold. Bold is everything in, for you in the world. If you're a behavioral researcher and say cognition, it's reaction time, RT. Uh, if you're Fred Morrison, it's ERP <laughs> or Bill Gehring, right? Uh, if you're a genetics person, SNPs, short, longs, what are you? So you, you we tend to focus on a few sets of variables. We're not very good about integrating across variables and being able to make trade-offs. Um, there's a whole bunch of things, I, uh, other little details I could talk about, such as different time scales. What I want to show you now is what it would be like to try to do an emotion study in the scanner, in the MRI scanner. So imagine you want to study um,
uh, the effects of meditation, you know, getting people to be calm. So you think, I want to study, I'll put them in the magnet, I'll record the bold response in the brain while they're meditating and being calm. So you have to go into this tube, right, it's a little bit claustrophobic. And that's what you hear the entire time you're in the scanner. So how can you possibly relax and be calm and meditate when you've got the scanner noise? Right? So these are things to consider. Under the current technology, it may not be feasible to study that research question in that modality because it interferes, right? The noise interferes with your ability to study your research question. Or you could find ways of getting around it. You could habituate people. They come in every day for an hour and they sit in the mock scanner and they, you know, to the point where now they, they don't, it's just background noise. They don't even notice it. Uh, you know, again, how, how realistic would be a study of, of meditation under, under, under those conditions, right? So there aren't really a lot of people thinking about these issues. All right, once you start interacting variables, um, some of our regression intuitions actually fall apart. And uh, I'm not gonna get very technical in my talk today, as you've noticed, this is more of kind of a 3,000 foot kind of level. I'm happy to, uh, after the talk, get as technical as anybody wants with either the technology we're using or the models that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm presenting. But what I want to do now is I want to really highlight the importance of visualizing our data and our model together. And this will become critical when we try to understand multiple systems. Um, so let's look at two time series. We typically think of data over time. So the ERP or the, the EEG data over there. We have nine channels over time and it's continuously recording my, heart, my uh, heart activity and these nine channels in my, in my head. So let's take these two time plots. So we have a dependent variable one, dependent variable two, and I have 3,000 time steps. And so these are the trajectories that these two variables make. It looks like the top one sort of starts low at about 1,500 time steps. It goes to a maximum and then it decreases back to baseline at 3,000. Whereas the second DV has a little more up and down to it, right? It goes up and then it goes down and then it goes back, back up towards the middle. How do we analyze these different variables? Usually what we do is we'll run regressions on dependent variable one to understand what predicts its time course. We'll do a separate regression on dependent variable two. Some of us might even try to do something fancy uh, a multivariate technique, we might do uh, reduce the dimensionality, do like a principal component to bring it down to one variable, or we might try to do something fancier with a, a multivariate approach. But actually, way, the way these data were generated, you would never really be able to understand what they mean by looking at the data in this way. The data are longitude and latitude coordinates from a run that I took. So I was wearing a GPS watch. And this is the, this is the actual path that I took. So this is the, lo the latitude, the longitude. There was a, a lake here. I started in this position, right? And then ran east, went north, down south, and then headed back west to where my car was. So it's very difficult to get that movement in space from the two time sequences, right? You learn, you just don't get the intuition from the display of what the data really are. So here is the path I took superimposed on a, a Google Earth map. So while well, this is called parametric equations, we basically have two variables that are each a function of time. And instead of putting time on the horizontal axis and plotting each variable separately, we can basically plot x of t and y of t, 
on a scatter plot and trace the movement, right? That's what this is. This is a parametric plot of yt, xt. And what you're able to do with this is be able to sort of develop methods that allow you to test things that a lot of people will tell you you can't do. So if you wanted to examine how a change on x leads to a change in y, a lot of reviewers in behavioral science will say, wait, those are different scores. Different scores are unreliable, they're terrible, you can't, do, you can't work with them, so you can't. Well, but actually, if what you want to study is a change in x related to a change in y, it's exactly a change on change kind of measure. Okay? Now let's look at what, goes, what can go wrong when you don't visualize your data. So uh, there are lots of these kinds of plots. I'm just picking on this one because it's one of the most well-known ones. It's from the Caspi and Moffat group showing the effects of environment uh, measured as in terms of the number of stressful events and back to the serotonin SNP, the short and the long that I talked about in the previous, uh, a previous slide. And then a whole bunch of different uh, mental health variables like depression, suicide attempts, and so on. And the first thing you, you notice is the data look beautiful, right? Those curves, or in some cases, are nice lines, and they fan beautifully. There's very little noise. Well, it turns out that these are not data, because social science data never looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. So these are plots from the model. These are the model predictions. So you run a regression, you get all your betas, and now you basically plug in. If the predictor of number of stressful events was one, and however you dummy coded these three groups for short and long, right? You plug that in, and out comes the predicted probability for that person on that, or for that uh, combination of predictors on that variable. And now you can produce these curves, but the curves are the regression surface. The curves are not the data. As so I'll show you in a little bit, social science data is much messier. The important, one of the important points for me, though, is that when you don't plot your data, you don't really know how to interpret these plots. Currently, there's a big debate in this field about what the crossover point means and where the crossover point is located. Because it means something very different to a behavioral geneticist if the figure looks like this. Than, than something like this where it crosses over, right? Because if there's a crossover, then you have a gene, man interpretation could be that a gene could uh, magnify the effect of an environment. So if you're in a very uh, enriching environment and you have that particular gene, then you do excessively well. Whereas if you're in, a, in an impoverished environment and you have that same gene, then you do really, really bad. So the gene just magnifies whatever the environmental factor is. That would produce a crossover, right? So a very different interpretation. But if you don't plot your data, you don't know if the crossover is real or not. Because you could have something like this. Uh, this is a hyp hypothetical, where I have a bunch of data points for these three groups, green, red, and black. And yeah, the lines will cross somewhere because non-parallel lines cross. But there are no, if there's no data where, where they cross, there's no reason for us to debate what the crossover means, if, you're right, if you don't have observations at the point of the crossover. But we would never know that by looking at these plots, because these plots make it look like there are crossovers in certain places. And we have no idea if they're real crossovers or not. Also, how you sample your data can have huge effects. Let's suppose that this is the actual relation between an environmental variable such as severity of trauma that goes mild, moderate, and severe. And let's just say three different genotypes. Um, and PTSD is the, uh, is the dependent variable. The number of PTSD symptoms. So if this could be the actual relation between those variables having had the entire range. But suppose that you sample data and you happen to have moderate and severe individuals in your study. 
So now what you will find is this, which is everybody's the same in conditions of relatively low exposure to trauma. And as it increases, you see a magnification in sort of which gene is which is what produces the magnification. But your colleague in another university happens to do a sample a little bit different, right? They get a different a group of individuals in terms of how they collect their data, and they happen to get more at the lower end of the uh, trauma exposure variable. So they find a very different pattern. Or you were right there in the middle, and now you don't even have enough power to detect that there's any kind of interaction because you don't have the full range, so you think that it's an additive effect, that exposures and uh, genotype are additive factors. There's no interaction because you weren't able to detect the signal from the noise in the data. Okay. So this is, to me, one of the culprits as to why a lot of papers in, science, in, in our fields don't replicate well. It's not just because of the things everybody's talking about, the fact that they're using Fisherian st statistical techniques, or they do multiple tests, or they fish, they play with covariates, whatever. I'm not saying that's not going on. I'm saying that this is also an important culprit as to why things are not replicating. Because we can get very different results just by something that we may not be aware of in terms of sampling. We might make some sampling choices in terms of how we get our data, and that would inadvertently put us in different regions of that total space. And I'd like to see more of this kind of visualization. So what these data are is we have uh, two predictors, one dependent variable, so the variable that shoots up and down is the dependent variable. And the two predictors make up the floor of this cube that's spinning. The yellow points are the data. The, the purple surface is the best fitting uh, interaction regression surface through that. And what I did is I superimposed these red lines. There's one here, one there, and one there at the bottom. And those would be the three lines that would appear in something like, uh, whoop. right, when we do something like this with the three lines that people typically do. Um, if you were to take the regression surface from these data and do, say, uh, the mean plus one standard deviation, minus one standard deviation, your, those three lines are really sitting on a continuous surface. And what we need to do is understand what that interaction means and how we may be subject to potential influences of outliers, right? So is the reason this thing curves up because there's just a few data points up there that are making that, that weird kind of curvature appear? Or is that a real curvature that we need to understand, right? Is there any clinical relevance to those individuals that seem to be bringing up this curve way up into this, into this region. So by, by plotting both the data, which are the yellow spheres, and the model, with, which is the blue surface or the purple surface, you're able to really learn a lot more about what these data are trying to tell you. And now that a lot of our papers are available on PDFs and online, it's trivial to produce animations like this of 3D 3D representations, right, it's an animated GIF. You can plop them into PDF files, and when you open up the PDF, the little figure is spinning. And you can even get fancier, where you can have some interactivity. You can put some controls where they can zoom in or out, uh, change the speed. So we have potential for doing this pretty easily in, uh, in our published papers. I'd like to see us move in this direction. Um, a second example in the same spirit of sort of plotting the data comes from some data that uh, Coulter Mitchell sent me. And I, I don't want to get into the details because all I want to show is the importance of looking at your data and the model together as a, in a second example. But the key points of this data set is that there's a particular gene uh, looking at BMI percentile in children. And there's an environmental variable, which is the school lunch program, as a measure of poverty, right? How many kids at the school the sub-participant attends are 
participate in a subsidized school lunch program. That's a measure of poverty. So if you just do the traditional method that appears in the literature, where you uh, run a regression, where you have the school lunch program as one predictor, uh, the SNP type that the kid has as a second predictor, and the interaction of the free lunch program with the SNP type, and you plot the data in the way that are currently in the textbooks and that you see in the literature, you get this, this figure. The uh, dependent variable is percentile BMI, which is why there's uh, 50s and 60s. It's not that the actual BMI is 60, it's the percentile BMI. When you plot the data, the data look like this. It's about 4,000 kids. The data are separated into two types of SNPs for obesity, the, the particular non-risky on the left and the risky on the right. And you see that it's all over the map, right? There's observations everywhere. And so it's a very tiny signal in the noise. I'm not saying the signal isn't there. I'm just saying the reality of what the data look like is very different from what you would see in a published paper, which is this figure, and it makes it look like there's a clear effect, right? That if you have the, um, if you're in a poverty situation, you're high in the subsidy lunch program, it doesn't matter what gene you have, you're in the upper 50 percentile of BMI. But if you're in a, in a sort of a different type of environment in terms of there are very few kids in the subsidized school lunch program, meaning you're in a, in a wealthier school, school then the gene produces a big difference, right? But the data suggests that it's much more complicated. There are a lot of other covariates. There's a lot of other things going on. So here I superimpose not just the data, but a couple of different model fits that we're playing with. We're developing some uh, new ways of testing in interactions. And uh, we're also using uh, additional criteria of cross-validation. That's a concept that comes from the big data group. Uh, typically, what we do in social science is we do what we learned in our statistics course, and we either do p-values or r-squares or AIC, BIC, if you learned that. Um, and those are basically assessing how well the model fits the sample you have. But a question we, in addition, would want to test is how well does your model predict out of sample? Right, so this is where the cross-validation comes in. So we've added the cross-validation idea into the way that these, these models are estimated and tested. Now, the um, underappreciated aspect of interactions between variables is how the correlation between the two predictors that you put in your interaction term affects statistical power. So in the upper left, we have the traditional two by two that comes from an experimental design, right? You have two factors. One could be poverty, high and low. The other could be some biological variable, high or low. And you randomly assign people to the four conditions from the two by two. You have equal numbers of subjects in both cells. Wonderful power. But typically, we don't collect data that way, and our studies aren't designed that way. We use measured variables. We don't randomly assign people to, uh, you know, high or low uh, stress reactivity based on cortisol. What happens is that because of the way we collect our data, there are inherent correlations between the predictors in our model. And when you start testing interactions among variables that are themselves correlated, you usually start to lose power, and sometimes very dramatically. So these are different scenarios of sample sizes in each of the different combinations. So this would be like the classic two by two, right? Where you select the extreme groups, the highs and the lows, and you have four cells, and you randomly place, you know, 1,000 people in each group. So you have 4,000 subjects, beautiful design. But what if you didn't, you weren't able to do that, and you collected data that looked these different types of of distribution. So this one is, they're highly multicollinear, there's high multicollinearity between the two predictors. This gives you one-tenth the power that the two-by-two two design will give you. So the different distributions of, of how you get your data affects power in ways we don't completely understand intuitively, right? When we write our grant proposals, 
we typically don't go through and sort of try to figure out where, where are we and do we really have the power we claim we have. So the lesson here is to visualize your data and model together. Um, I want to go through this next example pretty quickly. I'm going to present some data that some colleagues from Poland collected uh, around food. And they were interested in sort of developing new interventions for weight loss programs. And if you think of a model like this, right, there's, there's biology, there's psychosocial factors around what we eat, and then there's the characteristics of we, what we actually eat. The sodium, the calories, the fat, the protein, etc. Now, systems are very complicated, so this is one pretty simple system of a participant looking at a computer screen having to make responses. And so there's lots of processors, all the sensory uh, activities going on, the motor processes are, are being active, there's production systems, right? So systems can be very complicated. Eating is even more complicated than that. So if we think about the food bi uh, biology and psychosocial factors as separate multidimensional spaces. So for the biology, what, what biological variables are related to food? Well, there's glucose levels, there's hormones like leptin that influence your, um, you know, your, your appetite. There's dopamine that's triggered by the reward of food. There's lots of biological factors that are going on. So at a particular point in time, you're a point in that very multi-dimensional space of biological variables. You choose to eat a snack. Well, what do you eat, right? It has calories, uh, protein, fat, sodium, vitamins, etc. So uh, what your meal or snack was is itself a point in a multidimensional space. And then there's psychosocial variables. How energetic you feel, how hungry you feel, the social setting that you're, you're in, whether you've had a couple of beers or not, right? So all that influences this complicated system between biology, food, and psychosocial variables. So let's, in the spirit of thinking about how to visualize data, let's start with the food multidimensional space. And to keep it simple, I'll just focus on three dimensions of food. Percent protein, percent fat, and percent carbs. So in that hypothetical world, or simplified world, there are only three things and it adds up to 100%. So you either eat 100% protein, 100% fat, 100% carbs would be this zero, zero point. And any other combination of those three things is a point somewhere in that triangle. Now the diameter of the point could be related to another variable such as calories. Right? A high caloric meal is a larger diameter. A small caloric meal is uh, smaller. And we can keep track. So this is that parametric plot I pointed out earlier with respect to moving around. Um, uh, X of T, Y of T. So at 10 o'clock, this person had about 20% protein, 35% fat, the rest carbs, and the diameter of this donut is relatively small, so it was a, a moderate amount in terms of calories. And the color can represent, say, a psychological variable, such as their satiety rating or how, how hungry they felt at the time of the meal. And the person leaves a trace throughout the day of all the snacks that they had, meals as well, right? So then five hours later, they had a relatively uh, high caloric meal that was about 15% protein, 50% fat, and the rest carbs. And then at uh, six o'clock, they had just a small little snack. And then they had a fourth at, um, at nine o'clock. Now the data set that was uh, made available to me involved individuals that kept track of every meal and snack they had for 30 days. A nutritionist then coded those snacks uh, based on standards, calories, percent protein, et cetera. And so I could create an animation, a trajectory of how that individual moves around that space and learn something about how what they eat did, how long they delay until their next meal, how what they eat now influences their choice for what they eat next, right? We can start to learn those kind of intertemporal relations across these three, three variables of fat, protein, carb. And 
I have superimposed the color which represents a psychological rating that was uh, collected at the time that they were eating the meal in terms of the satiety. So for this particular person, uh, yellow is maximum satiety, so it's in this region, relatively low protein, uh, moderate fat, the rest carbs. Whereas a different person, that same region is very low in satiety, and they have higher satiety in a very different region of the space. So we, could, we can now start tailoring interventions. If you want to tailor a, a, a specific weight loss program that involves altering the diet, you might make a very different recommendation for this person than you would for the first person I showed. Right? So this ability to take into account more information from the data and change the, what you learn from it is what, what this type of systems approach allows you to do. Uh, I'll skip this. Um, and then I've got to show this because this is one of my favorite ones. This is uh, Lou Penner's here. So he's one of the collaborators on this. So it is possible to do MRIs on tissues other than the brain. <laughs> and uh, we, you know, everybody just thinks MRI in the brain. But as many of you know, you've had medical conditions. You might have had your knee or some other part of your body in an, an MRI. Well, this is breast tumor. And the current critical standard in breast tumor um, these are for women who will have surgery to remove the tumor, but prior to surgery, they undergo a 12-week chemo cycle in hopes of reducing the size of the tumor so the surgery can be less invasive, the ne neoadjuvant treatment. And there's, the standard is to have an MRI prior to or at the start of the chemo, then 12 weeks at the end of chemo, you have your second MRI. And that way the surgeon knows what he or she is going into before they cut open, right? They can see if the chemo, you know, reduce the size of the tumor and so on. Um, now, what we don't get from that, the bookends MRI is the trajectory, the time course that the tumor traces during chemo. And if we could somehow get a handle on that, if we could sort of say, look, this is what the tumor looks at week two, at week three, at week four, at week five. If the patient is seeing that the chemo is working, they might be, it might be easier for them to tolerate or cope with the side effects of the chemo. If the, if the chemo is not working, then there can be a conversation with the physician about whether the chemo should continue or not, right? So, so more information is better than, than less. Now, uh, a group at Wayne State developed a new measurement device using ultrasound. It's very inexpensive. I mean, the reason the MRI is done at the beginning and the end is because it's too expensive to do it every week. But this ultrasound is relatively cheap, and it can be done every week when she comes in to get her chemo. And so in some pilot data for a grant proposal, what we show is I, I fit some exponential curves to this, these are about 21, 22 pilot subjects. And for many of them, the exponential is a very nice fit to the data, right? Uh, there's noise, some are clearly violated. So there's one participant that whatever they're doing is not following what the others are following. Um, and there's heterogeneity in that sometimes the chemo works almost immediately. And by the second or third week, the tumor is shrunk you know, it's a tenth the size that it was. And for others, it takes a little bit longer for the chemo to kick, to kick in. Uh, and then for others, this kind of, you know, this one here, where the tumor continues to grow halfway through the chemo, and then all of a sudden it drops down. It responded, it was like a late responder to the, to the chemo. So this is all biology, right? This is looking at heterogeneity and treatment and, and effect of treatment. But we could do the same thing with a psychosocial variable. We could have individuals reporting online, like every night, reporting things that are clinically relevant to when you're in chemo. Are you fatigued? How's your appetite? Do you have nausea? Uh, have you been taking your medications for side effects? This is a particular individual who was in a cancer trial, and um, what you notice is that things were pretty high. So these are quality of life. Uh, the higher is better functioning, and every night, in this study, the participants went in and answered about 15 quality of life questions. Uh, some were very specific around appetite, nausea, and fatigue. And for this person, the first week or so, everything was okay. But then you start to see a 
uh, obvious decline. So the scale ranged from zero to three. So at the beginning of the, of the clinical trial, things were pretty well, but a few weeks into it, drops all the way down to the opposite end of the scale. And this is the individual actually collapsed in his garage. And so his wife found him. He then was taken to the hospital, spent a few days in the hospital. Um, the point is that a week before, there's already a signal appearing in the self-report, right? What this individual is saying, there are changes in my appetite, my nausea, my fatigue, that this could have been informative. It's an N of one, I'm not making general claims, but I'm just showing you that it is possible to visualize social science data in a way that lets you see information that is not the typical, here's a mean in a table with the standard deviation in parentheses. I'm sorry, what's that? The darker gray band. Uh, one is uh, uh, f emotional questions versus physical questions. So depression, there were two emotional questions, depression and I forgot what the second one was, and there were 12 physical, like the fatigue, nausea, appetite. Um, other people have very different trajectories, right? So the, the side effects of whatever this trial that they were in sort of kick in, but then things get a little bit better. Um, we're hoping that by presenting these curves to the physician prior to uh, the, the meeting or the, you know, the, the, the appointment with the, the patient, that the physician will be able to see the curves about how you know, their self-report ratings and initiate a conversation such as, well, uh, I see that the last couple of weeks things have been getting better for you on both physical and emotional, right? Or things have been getting worse, what's happening? Instead of the physician walking in and say, so how have things been? And the patient says, oh, things are okay, could be better, right? And then they go right to the lab reports and all that stuff. So we're, we're hoping, we're doing an intervention where we're hoping by presenting these curves to the physician, we might be able to alter the quality of the interaction between the physician and the patient. So that's a, a project that's underway. And then, from a more modeling standpoint, as soon as you start looking at these trajectories, whether it's skin response or EEG, now there's a new problem that some of the research techniques that we know pretty well, like mediation, become actually very difficult to do on waveforms. So you might have a particular manipulation that you do, such as the cold presser task, where a person has to put their arm in cold water. And so the temperature produces a change in the brain response. That, change, that brain response is itself a wave. And that wave is a function of the temperature that they're in. It also produces a pain rating because the person could have a little joystick that they move and explain or communicate their perceived pain at that point in time. And what you're trying to do is a mediation analysis that has a curve as the mediator predicting a curve as an outcome. Right? So there's a lot of activity in the statistics literature and biostatistics literature to try to understand these kind of models of curves predicting curves. So this is exciting. This will allow us to start testing research questions in kind of very, very creative ways. And I'll skip all these. Lack of time. As usual, I put too much in the slide. Um, so the biosocial methods collaborative. What we're trying to do, one of the things is play matchmaker, right? We want to get the molecular geneticists, the MDs, uh, with the behavioral scientists working together on problems. And we get excited when they bump up against a methodological problem that needs to be solved. It could be a data collection, it could be study design, it could be data analysis. Uh, data modeling, data interpretation, right? Whenever you're up against something, then that's what we get excited. And we particularly get excited if what you're up against is something that involves multiple systems, right? If, if you have an MRI question, then the best person to talk to is an individual in the fMRI center, right? If you have a hormone question, the best person is someone that operates a horm hormone assay facility. But if you're up against something that involves integrating more than one biological measure, where there isn't someone you can go talk to, then hopefully we're that place, the Biosocial Methods Collaborative. Um, there are sort of three levels of 
uh, impact we hope to have. Some, the low, what I call the low-hanging fruit, are th impacts that we could have right now. So these involve working with existing data sets. The examples I gave today are all existing data sets. The data are already there, but people are not using them to the full extent that they can be used. So if there are techniques that need to be developed, we can help with that. On a more moderate time scale, maybe three, five years out, we hope to be able to influence data collection methods. So rather than passively waiting back till people give us data to work with, once we start learning things about what we need to have in our data to be able to work with in the first place, we hope to be able to influence the way data are collected. And then even long term, say 10, 20 years out, we hope to do something that is rarely done. It's happened, there's a couple of examples, but rarely do, is the biology side influenced by the behavioral research. Usually it's the other direction, right? Usually biologists figure out a new assay, they find some new thing like the metabolic syndrome, and then we as behavioral scientists say, oh, that's something new for us to play with to, to figure out. But very rarely do the biologists say, wow, those behavioral scientists figured out something really cool. Let's go and see if we can find a, a biological correlate of that. And there, there is one example. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to this one. Um, this is actually a, a, a personal slide for me. Um, it's the, I'm not a co-author on it, but uh, it's one of the first papers that basically inferred the presence of endogenous opioids, or what we call endorphins. And there were three behavioral scientists. Uh, John Liebeskin, I worked in his lab as an undergrad. He was a pain researcher. And uh, I did some epilepsy research, just you know, what an undergrad would do, taking care of the rats. Um, but the Huda Akil is the first author of this paper. She's now here uh, a faculty member. And what they did is they were studying pain, right? So they would basically create pain, they would put the animals in different pain settings and they'd try to look at the, the, the neurobiology of pain. And they noticed that the way these animals were behaving were really not much different from morphine addicts. There was someone in the lab that had some experience in a clinical setting working with morphine addicts. And uh, what they did is they injected the rats with a drug called naloxone, that what naloxone does, it only does one thing, it stops opioids from having an effect. It's sort of, you know, the lock and key idea of a receptor, it kind of blocks the, the opioid from having its effect because the naloxone gets in there and it sort of blocks. And what they found is that the sensitivity, you know, pre-drug, at the time of drug, post-drug, changed, suggesting that if the animals were changing their behavior, from the time they got naloxone, where naloxone blocks opioids, then the inference is there must be something in the body that's opioid-like, right? No one had ever thought that the body produces its own opioids. It never, was never a biological question that occurred to anybody. It was the behavioral research that basically found this, and then eventually when the biochemist then went in and looked, and sure enough, the body does produce opioids and there's receptors in the brain specifically designed for opioids, which is why heroin and morphine and so on are such great drugs because we're built to, to be responsive to that. Okay? So I'd like to see the Biosocial Methods Collaborative do more of these kind of successes. And the other thing I want to mention is there's a lab in engineering, uh, the Computational Biomedicine Corps. And what they do is they develop new sensors, right? So I'm wearing lots of sensors, the EEG cap, the skin response, the heart rate. I had the, uh, the eye tracker on. These guys have the expertise to develop new sensors. So if we say, hey, we want something that can do such and such, but it doesn't exist, they can develop it. And we've developed a lab here uh, in the... Uh, in the basement of ISR, where we have all this equipment that I talked about today, right? The eye tracker, the EEG, uh, the heart rate, the skin response. And we can grow, we can add more modules as demand occurs. We could add FNIRs if there's demand. We could buy the cap for the EEG that can be used in the magnet, so you can simultaneously record MRI and EEG. 
Uh, we could buy blood pressure equipment, right? This lab is designed to grow based on the needs of our research community. But furthermore, it uses exactly the same basic machinery that the engineers here use. So if they develop a new sensor, it'll plug right into what we have. So we, I, we're sort of moving in the direction where we can, through the collaborations that are happening, we can actually start doing things that currently are not possible, right? New assays can be developed, new sensors can be developed. We have people like, uh, like Evo here <laughs> who can develop new algorithms. Uh, Michael Elliott back there also can develop new algorithms, right? It's just a matter of getting us all together and working on common interest problems. And that's my sales pitch for why we need biosocial methods. So thank you. <laughs>